Welcome to the Leadership Labs with DeepRec.ai, a podcast where we delve into the fascinating world of deep tech entrepreneurship, company founders, and venture capitalists. I'm your host, Anthony Kelly, and I'm thrilled to have you join us in this exciting journey. In each episode, we explore the minds behind groundbreaking technologies, the visionaries who dare to push the boundaries of innovation, and the investors who fuel the growth of tomorrow's game changers. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome Jonathan Balzer to the show. Jonathan, great to, great to have you. Um, Jonathan's the co-founder and CTO at Blackhawk Robotics. So in this episode, you'll tell us a little bit about, about Blackhawk, what, what they do, and talk about you know what it was like deciding founders' roles in a business. And um, it's been part of a very interesting group called Future CTO. You know, really good to get some insight into this, which talks about performance management, leadership, and then I think an area we're always interested in hearing about is you know people's personal upskilling. Where, where has Jonathan developed in the last the last several years that uh, that, that he sees himself now versus versus when he started? But look, before before we get into anything, Jonathan, welcome. Good to good to have you here. Thank you very much for having me, Anthony. It's, it's a real pleasure. Nice. You've got um, you've got some time some time away now, working remotely from uh from the beaches in North Holland. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's absolutely. That's one of the perks of being a founder, uh, in particular, being a founder in the uh, in the IT industry, where you know you can uh, you can work remotely from anywhere you want. And uh, so I'm I'm actually taking that liberty, and uh, yeah, talking to you from here, from Northern Holland today, while my family is spending t- quality time at the beach. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that you think that you're from the beach. <laughs> but look, Jonathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about, about yourself, your your sort of background, your education, where did your entrepreneurial spirit come from? You know, sort of take us on the journey down, down from there and then lead us into where the podcast was, was born. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, so um, my name is Jonathan. As I already mentioned, I uh, I was born and raised in Dusseldorf in in Germany, and uh, I, uh, in in 1998 I went to study. I was, I was always technically interested, but when I left school, I I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I picked a very you know very common uh, topic, which was mechanical engineering. So I enrolled in a mechanical engineering program at uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology at the end of the 90s. I finished those studies, and and uh, towards the end, I I was introduced to uh, image processing, and that that got me interested in computer science. So uh, I switched to the computer science department. I did a PhD there, and I was also very interested, kind of in the in the foundations and the theory behind everything. Um, and so I, in parallel, while I was doing my PhD in computer science, um, I did a master's and uh, another master's in applied mathematics. And then for a long time, I wanted to be a scientist. <laughs> so, uh, so I went on, uh, you know, kind of uh, actually a scientist in the math, the math researcher in the mathematical science. And uh, so I did a couple of postdocs and, and ended up in, uh, in California in 2012 and spent three years there uh, as a postdoc in, at, at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, and this is kind of, uh, after three years, um, well, I decided to switch fields and, uh, you know, I was kind of close to the, uh, to the, uh, ecosystem of Silicon Valley, you know, getting in touch with other founders, other startup founders. And this is kind of, but you know, it's, it's still long before I, I really founded Batos. Uh, but, uh, this kind of sparked my interest in, in, uh, in entrepreneurship. And I returned to Germany in 2015 uh, to found Batos. I did. I did think for a minute there that UCLA was the um, university that they study in um, in time theory, but that's, that's Caltech. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. Uh, the, now, the American TV show Big Bang Theory. Oh yes. Yeah, I, 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 I just thought it was UCLA, but it's actually Caltech. 
it is it is Caltech. So my former uh, my uh, my postdoc advisor, he actually studied and DH, did his PhD at Caltech. So I was there a couple of times. Um, and, uh, but I do think, so it actually plays at Caltech, but, uh, I know people from UCLA who were actually advising the show That's from the good. theoretical physics department. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's a, yeah. that's, a, you know, it's it, one of the greatest times of my life there, you know, on, on UCLA campus, you know, meeting all these, you know, they, they have a couple of, uh, touring, touring, uh, award winners and, you know, no, Nobel, Nobel, Nobel prize winners and. Well, you, I don't, you don't personally meet all of them, but you, you know, it's it's just a very very interesting atmosphere. Lots of interesting people, and very, always good weather. <laughs> very surreal. Yeah, very surreal. Quite um, you know, quite an interesting point you mentioned there. I know it's not relevant to the podcast, but it's the degree that you chose when you finished school, right? You choose a degree because it's safe, not because you know what you want to do. Um, it granted, like that was that was quite some time ago. Um, even modern day, when I left school, I feel like I didn't know what I want to do. Um, I imagine when I have kids, they'll probably be the same. But what is wrong that we're not that people or young adults don't get enough time into working life that they actually have an idea of what they might enjoy? And um, I mean, school systems is so old. Is is very very old, I think, and, and it, particularly in Germany. I don't know how it is uh, in in other countries, but um, seems to be very static or very slow compared to uh, corporate or startup life. <laughs> so it has been the way it is, you know, for decades. And uh, I, I'm certainly, you know, now I have three kids of my own. They're not yet going to school, so the uh, the oldest is five years old now. But uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that you know a lot could be changed in German curricula uh, at least. So, yeah. but I, I I don't think it's a drawback, right? So it's um you kind of have an idea what you want to do. I mean, it's uh, uh I I also wanted to be a musician uh, because you know like as a hobby I'm you know I'm playing music and uh, but you know I knew well I have to make a living sometime and chances even if you're good at music chances you're you're making it that business. Uh, yeah, very slim. So, you know, but I was also interested in technology and engineering. And so mechanical engineering is engineering and it brought me where I got. And now I think, you know, I'm 100% happy with what I'm doing. So I wouldn't have chosen a different path. No, yeah. well, I just, I just always think for me, if I knew what software development was and software engineering was maybe at 16, 17, 18, I would have been like, I want to get into it. I actually, we're, we're the only town. It's very, very strange. Again, it comes down to my schooling, it comes down to my family circles. Everyone in my family is trained people. <laughs> so I'm also the fourth non paid person of males in my family. <laughs> so that's, that's unique in itself. But personally, for me, I just feel that if there was maybe more practical lessons where still people might have an idea. I, I, for me, I always just thought I'd like to exist. Yeah. I was 18 years old and it was possible. Seems very naive now, but that was just part of, uh, of what it was like for me. But um, so then, yeah, you went to Dusseldorf. Yes. Rat off. Yeah. Where so, did the idea come from? Right? You left UCLA, okay, you left UCLA in December. Looks like back off was about in January. Chris, yes, that's correct. Chris yeah. Well, no, <laughs> it seems like it, but it wasn't. So it was actually quite a, 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 a zigzag path before kind of Vatos, the way, you know, that it exists today was conceived. So uh, initially, um, my former, uh, I was planning to do something completely different with Vatos, actually. So uh, uh, there was a proposal from my postdoc advisor at UCLA to start a company together with um, with a very very large uh, corporation operating in the fashion business in the field of augmented reality. So computer vision, augmented reality. You would have been but, you would have been super early with that. Uh, yeah. Companies have only really started. 
yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, that that never materialized. <laughs> so we founded Vatos, but uh, you know, kind of uh, it it never it never took off because of the corporation. They were withdrawing from the from the whole plan. And then I spent a couple of years. Um, you know, I wanted to stay self-employed. <laughs> I enjoyed that very much while being a researcher, just being free, you know, to think and do, you know, not whatever I want. But of course, there's always constraints. And so I, I started doing freelance jobs just by myself uh, in the industrial domain. So um, what I did was uh, help customers um, reconfigure their industrial robots more easily by, you know, simple technique called parametrization. So there's, you know, robots do, you know, there's so many processes out there that you could automate in, in manufacturing. And each process is, you know, more or less unique. And that's what makes automation so difficult. <laughs> what is even more difficult is when you have one, you know, one machine, one line, one production line is uh, uh, manufacturing multiple products on one and the same line. And uh, it's, it's difficult because kind of the, the robot uh, and the, the machine has to ad adjust to the properties of the new product that you're manufacturing. And so, you know, I worked with businesses that needed that flexibility that were manufacturing, not one. So robotics has been around for a long time, right? So in the automotive industry, the way that it works is they'll set up the line once and then they manufacture 20, 30, 40, 100,000 cars over a time span of, of, let's say, two or three years or the lifetime of the, of the actual model. But um, here are, you know, now we have, we see small businesses venturing into automation that want to manufacture two or three or maybe 20 different products uh, and switching on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what I help them with. But in terms of uh, configuration, so configuring their robotic systems. And so this is where the idea emerged, making vision, computer vision, which plays a, a vital role in, in, in the industrial domain, making that flexible, also vision, computer vision. So that's what we're doing now at Vatos, computer vision for robotics. So making the robot see, outfitting it with a camera and interpreting the contents of the images. Um, so that has been around for 20 years also. So since you know the 90s at least, but it's still very, as the school system, very, it's very static, so very inflexible. And so this is, while I was working as a freelancer, this is where the idea emerged, combining what I learned at UCLA in my academic career, which was in computer vision, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and transporting that to, right, combining that with the problem of inflexibility and automation. This is where the kind of the idea of was conceived or the, the problem, you know, was identified that we're working on still today at Vatos. And then uh, in 2000, just to answer, uh, finally answer your question in, in 2000. So I went around, I was by myself still. So th there was nobody else. I was, I was, unfortunately back then I was a single founder. I'm not anymore today. Um, I went around and I said, this is, uh, you know, like going, uh, uh, it's really hard to bootstrap that kind of business. There's like a high, you know, technological debt. There's a high risk involved in developing such a system. So I definitely need founding, uh, funding. So, so I went around by myself and, you know, obviously it didn't work with institutional investors and, and we did um, uh, an angel round uh, in early 2019, in January 2019. And that's kind of really the starting point of Vatos as we, as we know today. So started, so started with an angel round. Uh, we also had a very generous research grant from the European Union and that combined enabled me to kind of build up uh, a small team. Um, and yes, so this is kind of the story of, of how Vatos was founded, like the Vatos that we know today. Yeah. So, a couple of interesting points there. Uh, I think people are typically to talk about a lot. Uh, one of them you mentioned is that the cost of introducing a software, you know, very sense of big big overhead you needed money you see a lot more startups now who are kind of like 
they call it a premium sort of service. And, um, you know, I know it's not, it might not be possible from you, but I guess you can see a lot of people that are now moving into it have that real product mindset and they come in with what's called like product led growth and so okay. that you can actually come in and look, you might get a couple of subscribers for 50 bucks a month. It's only 50 bucks, but if you have a hundred of those, you can in fact sign up there and get more. And it's better to have them help with overhead, right? And it always, always looks really nice. Hey, DC, Mr. VT, I need, I need an extra 800K. Now, whatever it might be, but I've got some money already. If yeah. this is what's happening, I think, I think we can, we can 300X this, this 1K a month I'm getting, right? We, we can do something here. Always a lot more common that's becoming now. I don't know if that's because of like stuff like Fortnite, might be a successful example of it. And maybe you see a lot of um, open open software that are now doing it. They did it to like the engineers. But if the company wants it, boom, here's Enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then another thing you mentioned, quite quite interested on that one. You mentioned you're not a sole founder. And more. Talk to me. Talk to talk to me. Why? Talk to me. What was the evaluation? What skills were you looking to bring in and another founder? And um, what was going through your mind then? Well, uh, uh, maybe I can comment on what you said earlier first. So uh, it's uh, uh, just to put things in perspective. So we're really special uh, compared to other, you know, high growth startups. We're not a high growth startup, but that, that's the reason. So it's, it's really that kind of the, the ecosystem in which we operate. So this product like growth, that's exactly kind of the problem we're trying to solve is get to a point, uh, of product like growth. It's, but it's, it's not, it's not that easy in, in, the, in the industrial, uh, domain. So in, in, uh, in, uh, in automation or in manufacturing. First of all, because the industry is very conservative, so uh, conservative. And second of all, systems are very complex. So we're only contributing one piece in a big machinery, which is the vision part. So the, there's the robot, there's the machine. And so, you know, we're a part of something much bigger. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not like integrating it is not as easy as, you know, you know, subscribing to something on the internet, right? Getting an account, getting a free account and then upgrading it. It's uh, hardware is involved. We don't do the hardware, uh, so it's it's really really much easier. So we're, we're that's exactly what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to make integrating vision into industrial automation systems as scalable as possible. It will never be as scalable as you know the companies that you mentioned. Yeah. And regarding and regarding my co-founder, so uh, yes, I so I was a uh, a single founder, and I knew that this is. Uh, not very common and now i know why so it's really really good to to have a co-founder so i onboarded my co-founder uh so he he joined the company just two years two years ago and so he's the sales guy i'm the technical guy and um i you know before he joined i i was wearing all the hats i had to do the fundraising the management everything so the clean up in the office <laughs> and uh <laughs> okay i did um, and it's, it's really great if everybody can focus on, you know, it's, I think it's fundamental that everybody can focus on what they can do best. Right. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a businessman by training and I'm also not, my talents are not in that. <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not very talented in that domain. So, uh, it's very good to have somebody who can fill that role, you know, from his skills, but it's really hard to find a you know, a co-founder and I've, you know, so I've, I've tried other people <laughs> and it didn't work out. So I think it's really hard to find somebody you can trust, right? So you'll need 100% mutual trust more than that. So I'm really glad I found, found that, uh, that person. You spend more time with, with, with the person you talk even more than with your spouse sometimes on some days. So <laughs> I think, yeah. I think look, you've had a really good benefit of it. And like I said, there's a good benefit of it to you is that a lot of people, when they're founding a team, they generally found that they all have the same skills. You know, they come in together as buddies from school, from work, whatever it might be. 
you have the option to come in. Yeah, here's my business. We're going about a year and a half, two years. Do you know what I really don't like? I really don't like the business stuff. I expect you don't like sales. My co person who I do is to join me on this venture is going to do yeah. the stuff that I I don't like. Or not even that I don't like. I'm just not the point of right? Because if you think, everyone says, if you can replace yourself with someone better than you, take the opportunity every time and stick to what you're good at. You know, and that's one on one, and you you've had you've had an opportunity to evaluate it where a lot of people have to come in and like you wearing all the hats, but they're also like you that they have all the tech skills, and they still one still has to stay tech, one has to go customer, one has to go finance. Plus, plus it's uh, you know it's just a question of their you know. Uh, timing right so it's uh uh everything just takes twice as long <laughs> you will only be successful in you know building the company if you you know you manage the product you build a good product you know from a technical perspective but you also you market the product so you know i'm only one person and the day has uh, 24 hours i also have you know as i said i have family it's uh uh I, I i simply cannot work 90 hours a week i'm also old <laughs> so it would be maybe it would have would have been a different story if i had been 25 um like i'm almost 44 now 25 uh, single and no intentions of exactly. having a relationship <laughs> I, I, exa exactly no but so this is one of the things that i've learned over the past years so i i heard this saying once it said you you always uh, uh, overestimate what you can do in two years, but this is the good part. You underestimate what you can do in five. So definitely things are taking much longer than I expected. Mm -hmm. And they would have taken even longer had I been on my own. So it's not just about not wanting to do something and not being good, but you know, it's like there's this amount of work that needs to be done if I do it by myself like from a leadership perspective, then it's just going to take twice as long. <laughs> what was the emotional time? All these multiple roles are doing on yourself. And when I say emotional time, I mean like doing the sales that you weren't particularly good at. If you had to focus on sales, I don't know, for a whole week, how, how did you feel after that? Are you brain? Do you feel like you were more stressed than that week than ever? Well, you know, like naturally, uh, things that, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of a chicken egg problem, right? So you, you, you don't, are you not good at the things you don't like to do, or you don't like the things that you're not good at? Because that's the question here. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not because it never, it, there's so many things even today that just need to get done that you know that don't are not that fulfilling right <laughs> so uh uh it's that, that's not any different but uh they just have to get done right so you just have to get the job done and then you still feel good that you know it makes me feel good if i get a job done that you know i've been trying to avoid for some time Except for that, you know, you cannot avoid sales, or you cannot avoid, you know, hiring, building a team, and so, so there's things that just need to get done. And but I, I'm really, I think, you know, I'm I'm much more efficient today and enjoying it much more overall. Hmm. If I can, you know, focus on what I'm best at, you know. Oh. But it never, you know, uh, to answer your question, it never, you know, it was, it was not a showstopper. It never drained me long term or. Uh, just seeing the, you know, it needs to get done. Yeah. I mean, I've been pleased by this future, future CTO. And we spoke about it briefly. What, what is it? What, what does it do? What's the group all about? Oh, well, so this is, uh, uh, this is actually, um, a group of people from, you know, I would say exclusively Germany. Um, we kind of meet once or twice uh, uh, every year and, you know, because exchange ideas, uh, best practices, experiences. Uh, so, you know, it's just an, a get together, an evening 
where, uh, of course, in front of, a, of an audience of es aspiring CTOs, founders, everybody who's interested in. So this is a meeting that's held uh, annually or sometimes biannually in Dusseldorf. And uh, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's a great, it's kind of like a conference, uh, conference, um, uh, yeah, it's a conference sort of thing. It, in fact, it, it, it was held yesterday uh, evening, but I couldn't attend because it was away. <laughs> kind of no a pity. Way. No way. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's good. That's good. So, I mean, look, uh, with this, I wanted to ask you some, some topics that I would expect, you know, to come up on, like, the, the future CTO from, as I mentioned, from team, from leadership. But I guess. Fundamentally, starting off with, with you, how do you organize yourself? You know, you've mentioned that family man is free. Um, believe, look, you're balancing now between a uh, founder, being on holidays, being a family man, being a podcast guest. Um, so look, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do with. And there's a lot of things that you have to manage, lots of things to think. This is after you've got someone doing the sales, but yeah. How do you organize yourself? How do you set yourself up for success? Well, um, well, not, you know, nothing, uh, nothing new, I guess. So, like, what, what many other other people do as well. So, I, I, uh, you know, I'm relying very much on, you know, tools. Uh, you know, the most important thing being my calendar, <laughs> uh, that I can share. <laughs> that I, yes, absolutely, that I can share, uh, that I can share with people. So I have a private calendar, of course. My wife needs to know when I'm, you know, when I'm gone, when I'm visiting a customer. I'm, I'm uh, gonna give you a really I have a third calendar with my girlfriend. So she can put in the things that I have to be to so I know what I can say no to in the future. Same same here, same here. <laughs> well, yeah, I, of course. So calendar for myself, and then of course a sh shared calendar with uh, a private shared calendar. Uh and uh shared calendar with co-founders, uh, employees, the team, of course. So, uh, and, uh, well, so this is for, you know, regulating your time, but, uh, um, uh, I, I also need, I, I reserve time for, you know, for planning and contemplation and then, then the tools that I use to order my thoughts. And, and just do the planning. So I really, I think planning is an essential uh, part of my role at Bafos. Planning, yeah. like trying to look ahead and predict. And as I as I just mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's a really hard problem, you know, planning ahead. Uh, you know, when I said it's uh, uh, you you overestimate what you would, uh, overestimate what you can do in two years but sometimes you you tend to underestimate what you can do in five years it always takes longer so that's also a question of plan so i i think planning is really important and when i do planning you know of course i take notes uh digitally um and you know i use a, a trello board um just mm -hmm. to you know prior, to prior. are you inside are you outside are you going walk in yeah, have I don't know a tablet in one hand going around the field. <laughs> well, I never, uh, I never. Uh, uh, it's good you mentioned that. So I never, uh, let's say, step out during the workday and say, okay, I'm going to go running and think. But I actually think I should do that because I know from the weekends or from my time off, uh, the best ideas, 99.9%, I have when I go running. <laughs> Yeah, they come, really, they, come, they, come, they come flooding in, right? Your energy levels, I mean, yes. you, you go running at lunchtime, your energy levels are great, you work great, and then you come back, yeah. instead of finishing the day, you're not like, oh, I'm so tired. You're like, hey, honey, you need to have a dinner. <laughs> well, I, uh, I should allow, sometimes I think I should allow myself to do this during the day. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, I have a family, I have a business, and, you know, then there's a bit of remaining time that, you know, I, I spend, uh, you know, getting active, you know, doing something, running, for example, and that's very limited, but it's actually, you could combine it, but I'm not allowing myself to do this during the week, just because, you know, it's like, there's Slack communication all, all day long, right, with the team and uh, with my co-founder and... Uh, customers also uh so it's like i would think that i missed something 
important, you know, while I'm gone for an hour or so. You yeah. Know? But I do, I do it, you know, like my planning, I do a lot of that uh, during the weekends when I go out and running. Uh, and it's, it's really the best times. So you have kind of the best ideas. Your head is clear. I, I don't know why, but it's, uh, it's guaranteed. I go running. I think about work. But things just start to order in my head that were kind of in uh, uh, in a big pile or a mess, you know. If I, if I do this, I'll get why, <laughs> and then and then you start trying to form a structure of the process. Um, exactly. Yeah, I get it. Quite quite, quite similar to myself, you know. You, people just start getting the calendar invites on a on a Sunday um, about how the week going to set up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So calendar you know just uh i i sit down you know once i've 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 uh i uh have reached a you know kind of a result uh, after running for example and then you know i write things down and maybe reorganize them in in a in a board in a trello board or uh, in, in google keep and uh yeah that's it that's kind of my my main tools very uh heterogeneous but uh it it, it works well for me Let's talk about something that I, I would gather comes up quite a lot with um, new CTOs, firing CTOs, or even just young companies, interviewing, interview process. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest difference between, let's say, just interviewing people or then having like a purpose driven interview where you had a physical process behind it, you have a scoring system that was meant? Did you, did you ever make that change? And what was the difference when, when you, you process behind it? Well, that's a, that's a good question. So we had to, and we did put a process behind it immediately. Um, so, uh, you know, I never hired before I raised uh, funds in, uh, in 2019. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, so I, I, we did an angel round. I was uh, I was I was not by myself. I had uh, I had an, a different co-founder partner back then, so it was actually two of us. But we had this money from you know like the angel round, but also from the research grant, and we you know we could easily build a team of three or four people, and it was really really difficult in the beginning. Interestingly, so uh, we couldn't find anybody. <laughs> So it, it, uh, uh, it, it was really, really difficult. And interestingly, that turned around completely. So, but I, I had, we had to put a, a, a process in place uh, for two reasons. First of all, the resource was scarce. You know, there was not a lot of people we could interview. Uh, so we need to be, you know, we needed to be very thorough. And then second of all, I think, you know, what I've learned by now and, and, and you know, it's a common wisdom and, but it's like, I, you couldn't repeat that enough is uh, choose your partners wisely. So like having a good team in every respect, technically, socially, this is one of our big strengths. So we spend, we were very, very meticulous about hiring. And so uh, really, so uh, we are uh, currently, so it's me, my co-founder, and we have four team members, four technical team members. And they've been around since the beginning. So there has been practically no fluctuation. And I'm I'm a bit proud of that, right? And it's very important. That's one of the biggest assets that we have a we really well functioning team. So yes, we did put this uh, process in place very very early on. Now now I guess you're interested in how that process looked. I you know I hope I I can recollect because I haven't hired anybody in in some time, and I hope to hire again very soon. <laughs> um. Well, it's uh, you know, so the. We, I think we had a three-stage process. So uh, uh, we were, you know, of course, collecting all the uh, the applications, screening the applications, and then my my co-founder would have an initial conversation with those candidates that we were interested in, um, and uh, and then we had a uh, technical uh, a coding interview over the phone. So a mixture of a technical interview and then a coding interview, actually with live coding. <laughs> Um, like I have been through it, uh, I've done this at, uh, I think at, uh, Google and Apple and, uh, 
So we actually did that as well. Because we needed somebody, you know, we need people with, you know, kind of basic technical skills, knowledge, but we also, you know, we needed to build a software product. So we needed coding skills. And then we invited people to the office, uh, you know, meeting them, going to lunch with them, and then we would make the final decision. So that's kind of the process that we went through. You know, I like the fact that it's also relatively simple. It doesn't have to be... You mentioned Google it doesn't have to be seven or eight steps, right? You're also in a position where you want to attract people, not have them be like, "Oh, I'm not doing seven interviews, goodbye." Yeah. Like, like unfortunately, and look, if anyone's listening to this and they do have a five plus stage interview, yeah, I highly yeah. recommend you reconsider that. You yeah. might think you're putting candidates through the process, through their drill. But unless you're Google, candidates don't think you have a right to do it. You know, they yeah. won't do it. Amazon, yeah, these companies have earned their strike to, to demand that as an entry bar. If, if you're a new business, you can't make those demands, unfortunately. <laughs> and I tell you what, you know, so uh, uh, intuition, so with me personally, played a major role. So... <laughs> I, I'm not very esoteric, but uh, uh, really, it, you have to have some form of gut feeling. So, yeah. you know, like the technical skills, you can, you know, you can test, right? So you can put a check mark and say, well, you know, so this is, this is what I want. And, but then, like, intuition played a great role, at least for me. So, you know, I would say, okay, this is, you know, after meeting somebody in person. So this was really important to me, seeing somebody in person, having a conversation uh you know face to face uh having you know lunch together now i would say that's so team fit so important it's so incredibly important um kind of mindset and uh and yeah so we have very so what we, we also knew what we were looking for so uh, it's uh i wasn't looking for specialists because we're a small group and so i i was looking for generalists i'm a generalist myself so actually, uh, we have these two pillars in our team. You know, there's the computer vision team. These are kind of, they're doing algorithms. So really, they're development algorithms. And then we cast those algorithms into a, uh, into a stack, you know, kind of a, a, um, a Kubernetes stack. So then we have the other half of the team is the, you know, like developers. <laughs> so really, you know, they're writing code, all they do, but they don't really work algorithmically. And that already makes it very interdisciplinary and you know everybody also like i did has to be able to wear to some extent of course every hat yeah so i need people you know i have one developer who's also a trained kind of electrician so we have a project where where the robot connects to uh to the to the device we kind of really have to uh, parse the signals, you know, the binary signal from, you know, voltage from a cable. So I'm glad I have this guy. So I'm I'm not versed in that myself. So he can do it. So that 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 was really really important to us to have a you know kind of a diverse group of generalists rather than specialists because I the, the specialist I can't reuse, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm really and it's we're in a very dynamic environment and and you know kind of uh, the the tasks they change on a day to day basis. So, so, so good start out there. Um, good that you have a team that's open and willing to do that. Uh, but again, look, I wanted to help because you have you've hired four people. They've all stuck around for what is a lot longer than the average expectancy of, of any employee, right? I think the average at the moment is 13 months in tech. So, you know, oh, really? you, okay. yeah, you're, you're talking, you pre x that. To me, that comes down to we spoke about interview process. It comes down to you know selection, but then uh, there's elements of it that are up to you, uh, which is which is management. You know what are what are your management principles that that you do? And I mean you can talk about performance management, how you're upskilling them, how you're keeping them engaged. But what are you, what would you say your management principles that you 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 lay out to the team? It's not to say that like you know you're a, a principal of a school. But, I guess it's kind of like your standard, your standard operating model of, of management. Well, uh, that's, uh, let, let me try to kind of <laughs> give you the, the big picture yeah, to yeah. lay it out. 
Might be him. So yeah. it's yeah, I, I, you know, I uh, we are in a very you know like uh, I I breathe a very agile spirit, right? So we have a you know there is a a, a goal, right? So we're developing a product, um, and but the way to get there is unclear. We're not making this big plan that we uh, execute, but uh, we are, you know, in some ex to some extent, we're, we're op operating in, a, in an agile or myopic fashion. And so my job as the CTO is to, you know, I have the goal, I see the, uh, the, the steps to take to get to the goal ASAP. So, and that kind of uh, amounts to work packages. So I'm the one who I'm responsible. I'm the captain of the ship. So I see, you know, what, where, where is the, where's our destination? And, um, you know, I, I know what steps I have to plan the next steps that will ultimately get us to that goal as fast as possible. So that's kind of my role. And um, I'm kind of, the, my first job is, you know, getting those, uh, those packages, those steps, those, uh, uh, and then what I'll do is I'll have to, the second task for me is to distribute. As I said, I have a very uh, diverse team. So many people can do many things. So I have to make sure that that's also part of planning, right? So uh, increasing the e efficiency. Uh, who does what? So overall, we're done as soon as possible. <laughs> so distributing the workloads, then talking to the employee. Uh, explaining the work package, you know, having discussion, you know, like discussing options of processing the package. You know, there's always different solutions to a problem, a sub problem. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, as you said, um, monitoring. Uh, I think you're dropping out. Okay, so ultimately, then, as you mentioned, mo monitoring monitoring whether the po the package has been you know the work package has been processed uh, successfully and in time, and this is kind of the the overall uh, process, kind of the big picture of of uh, of my you know my management style or <laughs> the way that we we operate at Vatos. So yeah, do you, do you have anything that you would say you do particularly well to keep people engaged, right? You've got people that are close to four years. People that are four years. Mm -hmm. Do you have is, is it the work do you think do you think it's the fact that they're getting cross trained with these different sort of disciplines, right? The software guys will learn absolutely computer vision, the computer vision guys yeah. will learn software. Just an outrageous yep. learning environment, right? And you're hiring tech people. Absolutely, I think that that is the reason. So, uh, uh, what I've learned from uh, what I've learned is that the most important thing uh, is not money in a job. Uh, of course, we have you know we have incentives, we have a, a a virtual stock option plan, things like that, standard things. But purpose beats that by far. So purpose is one of the most important motivations for the people that I work with. So purpose right. in, the, in, in terms of they'll, they'll see, they understand the idea of building this product and uh, they support that. You know, they can share that vision with me. So that's number one. Uh, that makes up a huge part of the motivation. The second one, of course, is, you know, like we're a group of nice people. Everybody likes each other <laughs> just because we do have team fit. Despite the Corona uh, pandemic, right? So we were in the office. Uh, we started off as a team beginning of, of that, that uh, phase and then came uh, COVID and everybody started working remotely and, you know, largely still everybody does. And then third uh, is what you mentioned. So I think it's because we have uh, generalists and I require everybody to, you know, kind of learn the other things there. So we don't have time and we don't, I don't uh, upskill people uh, in some official ways that I send them to a training or anything. They learn, I think, so much on the job. So I'm the one who facilitates, right? So I kind yeah. of know, I learned by myself and, you know, during my academic career, I'm seeing, you know, by my experience, now I'm kind of ver versed in both worlds. 
and I introduced them to the other world, so the development world uh, and the computer vision uh, world, uh, and vice versa. And that is, I think, that's also a large part of the motivation is that the folks that I have that I work with, they are like eager to learn, uh, and they see the value of that. So, uh, and uh, and that's kind of the the different components of uh, what motivates them. But it's not money. It's not. It's it, it's really what they work on uh that they're you know they're able to learn but it's not for everybody right so there's people who say you know i don't want to take responsibility uh you know i i want to do one thing that i know well and do this eight hours a day and, and i'm happy with that i'm most happy with that but not not the people that i work with what about the people that do take on that responsibility and it's the first time doing it how do you create an environment for them to allow them to fail, ultimately, allowing them to fail means, yeah, look, you're not fired if you mess this up. But also, if they get it wrong, they'll never make that mistake again. Or if they get it right the first time, hey, great, look, everyone's a winner. Well, of course, you know, failure is uh, is a part uh, uh, is is uh, part of our lives of, of the job. <laughs> uh, it's totally natural. Uh, I, I make mistakes, my employees make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes. But I mean, of course, we do have now, let's talk about uh, tooling again, or tools and processes. Uh, of course, we have, uh, we have processes in place to, uh, you know, reduce the risk of error <laughs> or mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, our problem is, our problem is, as a startup, I think, is we have to move fast, but we cannot afford to have too much technical debt and to make mistakes, grave mistakes. And you have to balance that out, right? <laughs> so you could sit there and overthink something for a very long time to make sure you got it 100% right. And, uh, but then you're dead, right? So because you're not fast enough. <laughs> I mean, dead in terms of business. Um, and so this is, this is really kind of also my, my part of the job. And so I do allow to, uh, to make mistakes, not just, my employees also, I allow myself to make mistakes, uh, but to safeguard this process, um, of course, we're, we're using, you know, we're following best practices. We have, uh, you know, like unit testing pipelines, integrate auto, auto everything is automated, uh, 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 unit testing, integration testing pipelines. Uh, we have staging environments where we test our software. It's really important, right? So we're in the robotics domain. It's not, if we make a mistake, then the robot will have a collision. So mis mistakes are potentially fatal, or you know they'll in incur cost, <laughs> like a damage, a lot. You know, right? So if the you know we we build a vision system that tells the robot how to pick something out of a box, so and not to collide with the side of the box. So uh, if we make so our systems, they have to be one hundred percent safe, secure. So um, you know we have all these tools in place to make sure uh, to uh, guarantee sufficient software quality. But then also we work a lot. So when we, you know, when we get really to the bottom of that, right? So uh, uh, when we devise our algorithms, we also make sure that there's multiple layers of safety. Um, like in, you know, airline industry, right? So when you build yeah. an airplane, uh, there's always two colors, redundancy, there's uh, a different layers of self safety. And we have similar, requirements or similar methodologies for the industrial domain. It's probably not as bad if a robot, you know, hits a box and is, is broken as when an airplane crashes, but, uh, you know, we kind of use those methodologies as well in, in, de in developing our software. Right. Nice. Um, you also spoke about action and vision. Just a personal interactor. How often do you relay the vision back to the team? Is it weekly, bi-monthly, monthly? monthly? Do, do you have a, I know some people say we do it at the start of the week, the midweek, the end of the week. Here's our goal. Here's our vision. Here's why we're all here, right? V very, very good question. So actually weekly. Yeah. So I have, I have one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, where uh, with everybody uh, on a weekly basis where we talk about, you know, work packages, discuss solutions. So I, I'm not a fan of having like a big meeting uh, and, you know, and talking about technical 
uh, things in that meeting with everybody. Because when you talk about a detail, the rest is born because it doesn't concern them. I, I remember that back in my PhD, you know, we had this meeting with all PhD students, 10 PhD students, and the meeting would go as follows. The pro professor would say, hey, you know, what is, what is up? What is new? What happened last week to everybody? So the meeting would be like three hours. Oh, and then great. one person was speaking and nine other people were falling asleep, right? So because they didn't understand what was going on. So I'm not a big fan of, you know, talking about the very, uh, the, the smallest detail in a group of engineers. So I try to avoid that, but we do have a weekly get together, kind of like a town hall meeting. And this is where kind of vision, the big picture is uh is is really in in focus and i think it's super important uh and part of the motivation again you know that people are aware of what is the goal what you know what am i what am i working on right so because all of them are just working on a, a part of the whole thing uh you know they're working on a wheel and the other one is working on the engine the other one is working but you know together we're building a car <laughs> and they, i think they should be aware of that it's large part of the motivation of the team so we do it on a weekly basis actually right, right. but apart from that you know we discuss you know administrative things and and but i try to avoid having long technical discussions where that that doesn't concern everybody in the meeting cool um, ready for the quick fire questions gentlemen yes absolutely nice and easy one um is the content books podcast that you listen to that you would recommend to to to, to someone else? Well, <laughs> I do. Uh, you know, I'm I'm here with you, and I, I really enjoy it, and I'm contributing to a podcast now. But I have to be really honest. Uh, I'm I I have no recommendations. I don't I don't really get the time uh, to listen to podcasts. And as I said, I have a young family, and then it's really family. Then the core work and then maybe a bit of sports during the weekend you know this is kind of fills my week uh, i just i'm currently uh but it's not a business book still inspirational so I'm, I'm i'm reading right now the first time in months i'm reading a book by uh by uh by carl sagan <laughs> who i it's admire a, very much <laughs> it, it, it helps like time music when i go running i listen to podcasts when i run down Okay. Doesn't doesn't get the heart rate out as much, but uh I think it's probably more interesting, weirdly enough. Well that's actually a good idea, but it's been, you know, running with music or, you know, headphones was just bothering me. And then as I said, you know, it's uh I can either listen or sing and it's so productive when I'm not listening so I'm not listening to anything, but I can can just think while I'm running. Yeah. Uh that that I I do prefer that. Um, what are, what are your three non-negotiables when it comes to being an entrepreneur, leadership? It can be non-negotiable you set yourself or you set your business. Well, um, I think I mentioned those. It's, uh, for me as a CTO, the most important trait is is being able to plan. Like planning, you know, seeing where where the whole ship goes, the destination, and then, you know, planning the steps. And you still, you know, you will always underestimate the time that you need to get somewhere. So really planning uh, is, as the CTO, I think one of the most important skills. And then, of course, you know, kind of converting that plan into uh, uh, bringing that into action, you know, it's motivating the team to as efficiently as possible work through the plan that you've worked out. And last you said three yeah. two or three so the, la the last thing um that i think is very important i mean it, it it affects the team as well as customers and investors so communication i think communication skills are super important so being able to uh to talk to customers to understand their requirements but also to be able to say no right <laughs> Uh, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't do that really well when I started. So when no, I was no, still no by myself. <laughs> yeah. Excite, excitement takes over. You think you can do it all. Exactly. Exactly. So kind of balancing 
uh, between, you know, you need this job really desperately, <laughs> so you better listen. And then, you know, taking jobs that just deviate you from your path and your original goal. So, but uh, communication. So that's a communication with customers, with your employees, uh, investors also uh, is, is, I think, a very, very important skill that you need to have as a founder. If you could do it all again, what would you do again? Um, well, um, I think uh, I there's not a lot I would do differently, but I would be more careful with the choice of the partners. So without you know wanting to go in too much detail, but uh, this is kind of I can stress I can't stress this enough that that wisdom is true, choose your partners wisely. And yeah. uh, the, some, some decisions are really hard to uh, uh, revert. And uh, it's, it's, you have to be very, very picky with the people that you you work with. And I have made mistakes in that regard. And uh, those things, I, I would give myself more time in, in picking partners and collaborators. So that I would have done differently. And the other thing, uh, not be as optimistic as I was about timing. <laughs> good one, good one. Things, things always take longer than you expect. That is also true. I, I've learned that. <laughs> good, good. Um, well, yeah, look, that, that does us for time. Jonathan, it, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I have to thank you for, for having me. Thank you very much. That concludes another enlightening episode of the Leadership Labs podcast. If you found today's episode thought-provoking and informative, be sure to subscribe to the Leadership Labs on your preferred podcast platform or on YouTube. Thank you once again for joining us on this journey through the Leadership Labs. Until next time.